Tina Desiree Berg. That's right. And this is our first. Our first uh, show, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing my own live streaming to, to really, to my own whatever we want to call it. Uh, she does her own show. You want to quick plug your show? District 34. Doing content <laughs> about her local district that's here in California and Los Angeles. So thank you for joining us. We are uh, still working out the name, but I think you're going to really like our content. We're bringing in Curtis Wild. Curtis Wild sits in a number of really complicated positions that are important to keep track of because not only is he a sitting DNC member, yeah. but he is also a successful wrestler. He is. So- and I think it's important to mention that Curtis was one of the few Bernie super delegates in 2016. That's correct. So we're going to give his official title. This is what he gave me to say, and I had to actually read off the thing it's a lot so he's a bernie crad elected dnc member national dem enter spokesperson mid-missouri wrestling alliance that's mmwa heavyweight champion new breed wrestling nbw united states champion husband father and futurist curtis thank you for being here thanks for having me (laughs) (laughs) yeah we'll we'll let you talk i promise it was coming and i would say that you should throw out what the name of the show should be to your, your audience, to the crowd, and I mean, that's how progressives do. We're grassroots, so you need to throw it out there and see what people want to hear as the name of your show. Are you suggesting that we participate in some form of democracy? Well, I would suggest that you participate in a poll, but we all know how polls go. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's... Who you ask. That's how we get named Showy McShowerton. Well, or, to be fair, my Twitter true. handle's that's Lefty true. Desiree <laughs> McLefty Face. <laughs> I like that name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's it, it really, I thought her name was Lefty for the first six weeks we were working on the show, so, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's not just such a great name. Yeah, she had to sit me down and be the like, that's, that's not actually my name. In today's political climate, in today's world, I think that Lefty would be a great name. I, yeah. yeah. I can't take credit for that. A troll called me that. Oh. That's where that came from. Going with it. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I decided to own it. So today is January 3rd, 2020. It's a brand new decade, and it's also apparently a brand new war. <laughs> That's yeah, happy new year, everyone. If uh, today my wife overslept and I got to inform her that World War Three started before she got up. I wish that were a joke. It's not really a joke. And I want to have a light, fun show. But I think as we came in to do this today, it's impossible to not talk about what's going on. So, Curtis, you're an elected DNC member, you know, making the big decisions. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Because I hear some, you know, scary meetings and whatnot. I'm sure you'll have some input on. But what are your thoughts on what's going on right now? Well, it's very possibly going to be World War Three. So we definitely got to consider the seriousness of the matters and what's going on. But when I look at the situation, you put a baboon in the White House and now things are a jungle. What exactly did we expect? We tried to warn you in 2016 that Donald Trump was very possibly going to start World War III, mm-hmm. possibly from the toilet, possibly from Twitter. Possibly uh, from the toilet. Well, the, the Twitter <laughs> is the and internet, the toilet of the internet, listen. right? People did not listen, and now no. they're seeing the gravity of the mistakes that we made in 2016. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to me because he ran on being non-interventionist. And then one of the first things he did when he got into office was start appointing neoconservatives. We had John Bolton, 
we have Mike Pompeo, who's out there basically making the same sort of commentary that he made back on the Iraq war. And then, you know, Mike Pence was out there today basically making 9-11 conspiracy theory claims as a basis for what they were doing, i.e., the guy we killed was, you know, part of those 9-11 jihadists, when in reality it was the Saudis. So obviously they're building the case on a bunch of lies like they did on Iraq. And I always am concerned about this because it seems to me our entire Congress, minus Bernie Sanders, tends to fall in line on this. And the American population just seems to believe whatever lies that they're told to believe. They've never heard of this guy until today, but they're all now convinced that he was engaging in planning terrorist attacks, which is absolutely ludicrous. Well, that's the power of the media in general. And people, it really fits into that, like, people don't want to... It's like when you tell somebody they need to work on something, they always fight back because they don't want to know what they don't know. And so whenever people are informed of something that they didn't know, they're quick to just adopt whatever it is they're being told to know. And Mm -hmm. I think we're getting a real taste of that right now. Mm -hmm. So before we get Curtis's thoughts on this, I just wanted to say one thing. I just, you know, about Trump surrounding himself with all these neoliberals, I'm just going to go out on a limb and, and think that maybe he doesn't necessarily have the political nuance to understand difference between uh one or the other and or to even know what he's saying when he said that in the first place i mean i think the difference is this trump is always pro corporate america he's a corporate guy he's about increasing the profits for the platonomy across the board and part of that initially in his brain was this sort of trade war stuff that he was getting into. Well, I'm going to protect America by um, adding tariffs to things because then that will in turn help working Americans. You know, this is the kind of shit that he tells himself. However, you know, you can go back to the 1960s when the CIA overthrew the elected government in Iran because they were going to nationalize the oil. What happened immediately after that? Well, the Shah gave 40% of the oil fields to U.S. companies. So all of this comes back around to either the military industrial complex or it comes back to protecting corporate profits for multinationals that are based here in the United States. Go ahead, Curtis. Let me me, uh, chime in and say that it's really interesting that the stocks of the military industrial complex corporation are skyrocketing right now. Uh, exactly. Just before the new year, yeah. less than two months ago, mm-hmm. they discovered 54 billion barrels worth of oil under Iran. That's right. So all of these things are coming together once again. And then, you know, you look at Venezuela and you look at other places and you see that the military industrial complex is definitely getting involved. And there's always oil in the mix. Yeah. Venezuela is one of the, the biggest oil reserves in the world. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's a reason that they couldn't allow socialism to flourish. Mm-hmm. Mm. Part of me really misses in my imagination what was the nuance of the CIA in the 60s and 70s. <laughs> Which was not but, very But nuanced. really, it wasn't very nuanced. <laughs> they were just able to control a lot of the They history. controlled the media that surrounded what they were doing. That's right, the really right. That's the major difference here. But what I want to understand is why the American population keeps believing their shit. Well, that's the power of the media. And that's why you guys are doing what you're doing. Yeah. And that's why I'm going to uh, be launching my own podcast this oh, right month. On. Blog, go. W-Y-L-D-E-S-Y-D-E. Uh, the Wild Flag is going to be a podcast uh, that tries to give the progressive voice uh, some amplification and tries to talk about these things that not enough people hear. Because right now, the, the mass media is the most powerful message that mm-hmm. is getting out. Um, but we've got to realize that if we come together, we can topple that. And yeah. we can yeah. uh, tell what's really happening. Because, I mean, it, it, a report just came out on the Daily Wire. And some people don't like the Daily Wire, but they're putting numbers together. And numbers don't lie. You know, you look at, at Fox and ESPN and MSNBC, and they're the top three. CNN has been outed a number of times for not telling the correct message and mm-hmm. not representing Veracity. in good faith. Yeah. CNN is now number 22, and then at the top you've got Fox, ESPN, and MSNBC. Fox 
is seen in more homes than all of the other ones. So obviously they have better ratings, and their message is entirely dangerous for the most part until they start being honest about things that are going on, you know, in the Democratic primary, which sometimes they seem to do more than supposedly left leaning media. And the top three shows are Hannity, Tucker Carlson, yeah. and Bad Al. Which is scary. And all of them, all of, yeah, all of them have around 3 million views. Now, you look at somebody like Joe Rogan, who averages, what, 10, 15 million per show? Yeah. We can true. topple the media. We, we can, can topple the mess. And so we need to do that. I agree. And, and I agree. The only yeah. way that we can prevent people from believing the messages that the mainstream media is trying to feed the American public. And the reason that they're feeding the American public that is because their paycheck requires it. Their yeah. paycheck requires yeah. that they yeah. spread the message of their multi million dollar corporation, mm -hmm. billion dollar corporation in, in some respects. They have to spread that message. They have to appease not only the people who own their media corporation, but mm -hmm. they have to appease their advertisers. Yeah. Big pharma, big oil, That's right. big tobacco, whoever is funding their paycheck, they're having to spread their message and amplify their narrative. When it comes to the blackout and, and what's going on here, you know, you're really addressing a real issue that's happening. And we're actually seeing a bit of a reversal in some ways, which I think is very interesting, which I think is very telling for our first show. It's, it's going to be the pivot we're seeing within the media right now and why they're doing that. But also, everyone keeps that in mind that even MSNBC or CNN that say they're fair and balanced, these are huge corporations. They benefit from people like Trump being in office. They gave him an incredible amount of free advertisement in 2016. I did an interview with Lee Camp, and he really was hammering the issue in 2016 yeah. that how much time they gave him and what an impact it had. So these corporations that act like they're left-leaning are really they're, yeah they're not look i mean curtis's point is is pretty spot on in regards to big pharma and these other yeah. organizations that advertise on msnbc etc they they are the big ad dollars so there is something that goes on internally within these news or news i'm using my scare quotes organizations that placates them i mean here's another example i don't know um if either of you saw this but about I want to say four or five weeks ago on Twitter, and I can't remember which one of the MSNBC guys it was, but I got into a spat with him over the Bernie blackout. And I finally just said to the guy, I said, look, you work for a news organization. Where is your commitment to veracity? Guess what his response was? Well, no, actually, what I said to him, you're a journalist. Where is your commitment to veracity? His response was, that's where you're wrong. I'm not a journalist. Yeah, that's the media push. And that's a big line between being media that's and insanity. journalism. That's You work for a news organization. So I pretty much quote tweeted him and said, MSNBC, come pick up your trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, let's talk about the Bernie blackout. Yeah. Let's talk about what Don was just talking about, which is Trump getting a lot of free press. Mm -hmm. He got free press because when he was on the TV, people watched. They got ratings. Mm -hmm. And those ratings give them the ability to charge higher advertisement dollars That's for their right. commercials, right? That's and right. so they're giving out all this free advertisement and they're blacking out Bernie because Bernie is going to tax their owners. That's Bernie right. is going to tax the ruling class and the ruling class are the people who run commercials on their shows and pay their paycheck. So they're going to take a hit too. Mm. And that's why they don't want to talk about Bernie Sanders. They want to make Bernie Sanders disappear as much as humanly possible and really, you know, fight from the bottom. Because they require, if they can't get somebody like a fight or a war who's going to be friendly to these corporations mm -hmm. and, and keep the tax breaks and things of that sort of place, then they, they'll pay somebody like Trump because Trump will pay their paychecks. Yeah. Trump is ready. Yeah. Regardless of if it would smash style, smash style uh, or it would be called crash style in the professional wrestling world, crash style politics. To where, you know, before you you have recovered and really taken in one mm -hmm. thing that he does, he's already moved on to the next huge thing that you've got to take in. And right. before you know it, it just escalates and elevates, and we're in World War III. Yeah, yeah, it definitely feels that way. 
you know, something I want to throw in for everybody and you know, someone to add to what you were saying is that it does feel like with our billionaire candidates this year that it, and if you look back historically as they've run in different primaries, it does feel like the billionaires all take turns running for office to keep the price of the advertisement as high as possible. Like this year, it's Bloomberg spending 40 million just incredible. Like he could solve major major issues that are systemic in America right now with the amount of money he's spending on advertisement. He can solve some worldwide issues. Worldwide and he's not the only billionaire running for office. Yeah, so I just want everyone to know, too, this is a fun little fact I want to share with you as a as a little bit of an insider in a couple campaigns. So there's a thing in the consulting world that you make a cut right off the top of the ad buys through the company that buys the ad. So you sell your ad to your candidate and you don't charge, well, you charge them a fee. Let's, they charge a fee to them, let's be honest. But you cannot charge a fee because you get your fee from the people that bought the ad, that, that were sold the ad in the first place. So the reason we're seeing billionaires spending $40 million on ads is because some consultant came to them and said, wouldn't it be great to see your face all over the television? And the next thing you know, they've dropped $40 million and put $4 million in the pocket of that consultant. And that is part of the systemic problem that no one talks about, about money and politics, because this is the hidden money. This is the thing that's just business as usual. So when you have billionaires running, they inflate everything. So, Curtis, you can probably speak to this as a DNC member. It's not just the politicians and the candidates that do this. It's also the political parties. What was it the last go round? The DNC had what five consulting firms that they gave millions of dollars to? Uh, and, well, it was very few. I'm not sure. And I did want to write something earlier. I wasn't a DNC member uh, that could vote in 2016. I got elected June 18, 2016, but I didn't start my tenure until the day after the convention was voted out. Got it. Got it. So you were officially a DNC member only after the convention happened. Right. That's so you, the way that it'll go this year. For all elected DNC members, they'll start their term the day after Milwaukee. Yeah. So then, real quick, a reallocation has happened, and Florida picked up a DNC member, and Missouri lost one. Oh, oh why? Who, who lost their DNC seat? Well, nobody until the elections happen. The application right? happens. And there's four elected seats. There was four elected seats in Missouri, which right now are me, Megan Green, for Stephanie Tacopoulos, and Winston Apple. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were four party facts that got elected over Hillary superdelegates in mm-hmm. 2016. Um, and now there will be three of us, which is okay by me because I think that the one of the more powerful things that I could do for the political revolution and the progressive movement may not be within the party, but may be telling other people how to get in the party because really my adventure was into politics in general was to set an example and to show people that it could be done. Because within my first year, my first elected position was on to the DNC. And within my first year, I was on the state committee, I was on the county committee, I was the chairman of two legislative districts and the vice chairman of one senatorial district. And then in my third year, I picked up another seat. So I had seven elected positions within the Democratic Party within three years, and that was to set an example. And at the entire time, I looked like a biker, and I had hair down to my waist. Yeah. So you're saying that entryism works? Dem enter? Yeah. 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 Absolutely. The the dem enter strategy, it's not just a term, it's a strategy. That's how it has to happen until we have more parties in this country. Mm -hmm. Until we have a multi-party system, we've got two teams. And you pick a team or you don't get on the field. And they're not going to pay attention to you if you're sitting out in the parking lot or a rock building. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I agree. Yeah, and your, you know, Missouri or red state, I think that your uh, opinion on this is really important because, you know, depending on what state, like we're here in California, we have this amazing... Well, thank you, Doug. You should have me on as a guest. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're here in California where we... <laughs> you really got me. 
uh, we, we we're here in California where we have the like we could choose not to vote for a candidate in the general that we don't like, and it, it really change thing, it doesn't yeah. change anything. So, uh, but in Missouri, you're like fighting tooth and nail with Republicans. You yourself ran for office for state house a few different times, right? And you know better than anyone that these are certain things that if we want real change in these states that are in toss ups, we can't just be. I mean, it's, I don't want to tell people not to take the moral high ground because there's so many places we need to take the moral high ground on things. But when it comes to political parties, the two teams on the field... That's just reality. And, and it's hard for some people to hear that. And, and our goal with this show is not to, like, we're not some DNC mouthpiece. Like, I want to be very... Like, Tina uh-huh. is yeah. probably here cringing at some of the things I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, I think there's a difference between voting for a third party for Congress or something like this and voting for a third party at the presidential level in the state of California versus the state of Michigan, per se. In California, even if I, you, and everybody else around me voted for a third party, it would not affect the outcome of the election. I feel like we tried that. However, <laughs> however yeah, in, in a place like Michigan, it's a different outcome. So I think it. Well, you, in you Michigan- have to decide for yourself. In Michigan, they did that, and it actually turned out it was it was black women uh, that historically vote Democrat that chose not to vote for Hillary Clinton on the well, general election, and the three hundred thousand people that voted down ballot but didn't vote for Hillary really cost her the state. Didn't cost her the election because Florida, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. I mean, she cost herself the election. But Michigan is very interesting for the data of not voting and third voting and well, how that would affect Yeah, it. Michigan is interesting because you had a lot of Obama voters that chose to sit it out. Right. So you're correct on the down ballot. So it was 9% chose to only vote down ballot and did not vote. These are wow. the registered Democrats. Wow. So that's a... Well, unfortunately, that's what happens when you exactly. uh, bring no policies that excite people. Exactly. You have to bring policies that excite people. And when you don't, they'll stay home. Yeah. At least drive every time through the state, not fly happens. over it. A thousand times in 10 years where people try that strategy and it fails. Yeah. yeah. No, Curtis, I mean, here's, here's a candidate that was so full of hubris that she didn't bother to go back and campaign in a swing state she lost her own primary in. That's hubris. I know. One that she had a 99% chance of victory. And this is where strategist and as a strategist you okay know, but who says that was not like anybody with a brain could see she was going to lose like well, to me uh, this was like in michigan really? well michigan i'm talking about the prime the primary in michigan when she lost to bernie sanders by 51 percent. yeah that was and wild everyone had 99 percent she was going to win going oh, all into the way it. through they yeah, did they, yeah. it was not my point is is none of that polling was based in reality because no. it, it, in my opinion it ignored two things the first yeah. thing is that it ignored independent voters it does still. and in states where you have it does still you're correct in states where you have semi-open or open primaries, that's where you see these giant swings for somebody like Bernie against the establishment Democrats. Republicans vote, and, and even Pete right now is making his strategy about reaching out to moderate Republicans oh God, in swing states. Him. He's actually trying, well, we can't really criticize him for doing that because we, we, you know, Bernie people have been doing that for since 2016. I mean, how many times has Bernie been to West Virginia? And that we need that. We but can't he's not. Him. Hang on. There's a difference here. He's not reaching out for the disenfranchised working class and poor red state voters. He's okay, going well, for yeah, the platonomy. You're, you're he's right, going. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. And, and also, it's 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 just uh, Pete. It's like Pete wanted to get one dollar donations in order to lower <laughs> his total thing. And like <laughs> he we, had a contest. We did that a little bit to get Bernie over the five million mark, but like overall, people. I only had a dollar to donate a couple of times, right? I mean, how many how many times would you have liked a dollar donation to your campaign, Curtis? Every time. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. Point being that that Mayor Pete, I have to call him Mayo Pete, had a contest that he sent out. This for listeners that don't know what we're talking about, he actually sent out an email to his followers saying, "We're doing a contest to see who can donate the lowest amount." And it's clear from anyone that reads this correspondence that what he was trying to do is offset the money that he's gotten from the 40 or so billionaires that have donated to his campaign. He's trying to lower his average contribution Correct. number, which yeah. Bernie's was $27 famously. 18, yeah, well, it was 27, 27, 27, but it went down. Yeah. Yeah. That, was, that was like eighteen fifty four 18, or something. Okay. That was the day after the last debate mm-hmm. that email went out. 
him when he got called out on the wine cave fundraisers. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. The wine cave. Oh. You know what? That wasn't a wine cave. A wine cave is dusty, dirty, and dank. Well, where that else? was a fuck you to poor people. Look, look. Where else is your vampire coven supposed to meet? <laughs> Okay, and I and you know those are all the same spirit so drinking people or there, whatever they're called. Honest. Ted Cruz wasn't there. Be honest. Oh, oh! <laughs> Zodiac is not invited. We actually we well, actually saw that on the picture of Ted Cruz next to Grandpa Buster. Right. right. Yes. Yes. There's actually a, a gif of, or Jeff will argue. Ted about Cruz, They mold into each yeah, other. Yeah, they do sort of look alike. Oh yeah. Oh, oh no, we're gonna get a full. What I mean, on one hand, I was really upset when Beto lost to Ted Cruz because, I mean, I feel like if Beto had spent his money, the last 300000 that he gave to the state party or whatever it was, if he had ran with that money, he would have beat Ted Cruz. And it kind of feels like he always wanted to run for president. But on the other hand, wow, more Ted Cruz is kind of a gift that keeps on giving. I mean, he's a terrible human being. But every once in a while, you're like, God, you are comedy gold to have around. I know. I'd like to see Seema Hernandez win that election. Oh, That's, there's there's my plug for my yeah, candidate. Seema, yeah, she's been <laughs> she's been going uh, going strong, and I think Beto didn't jump in the race specifically because when he stepped on her toes last time, which right. he did, he acknowledged it because if he had had her voters, her strong Hispanic Latino voters, then he probably would have won the election. But he didn't reach out to them enough for whatever reason. No. So, Curtis, tell us about your hair. You shaved it off. I oh, saw no, the no, photo. No, no, no. He, he did, he did somebody not shave it off. Somebody else shaved it oh, off. I yes. saw the photos with you without hair, and I was a little bit like, oh. Oh, you need to see the video. <laughs> I haven't seen the video yet. Oh, yeah. Tell us what happened. Well, I've been a professional wrestler since December of 99. So, I just got out of my 20th year, the month of my 20th year celebration. And it, it was the main event, sellout, crowd, standing room only. People were buying tickets to stand at the door. It was myself versus the king of chaos, Ricky Cruz, Puerto Rican superstar. Sorry, I don't want to jump in. There's a piece of the story missing before Curtis goes any further. Curtis holds was holding at this moment three different championship belts and is in a position at the time that was very fun to say. He was the champs, champs, champ. And I just wanted to get that get that out there before he went any further. Sorry to interrupt you, bro. Please continue. <laughs> True story. And, and to put that into perspective, anybody who's ever heard about wrestling, it's the St. Louis area has heard about wrestling at the chase. Wrestling at the chase was a big deal where you could have the champion of Florida and the champion from Texas on a Sunday morning if the Checker Dome or Keel Auditorium or the Arena go one on one when you wouldn't see it anywhere else in the country. And it was a place that in the 50s people would come in and pull dresses and tuxedos, sit at tables and, and drink wine. It was a huge deal back then when there was less entertainment. And, you know, you could watch everything on your phone. And two of the companies, I work for three companies currently, but two of the companies that I work for are what evolved from Wrestling at the Chase. So you had the voice of Wrestling at the Chase, Larry Matisek and Herb Simmons, were basically Sam Munchnik, who was the promoter of Wrestling at the Chase. They were his right-hand man, and on the left hand was Tony Costa. Tony Costa is the promoter of MMWA, who I am their heavyweight champion, and Herb Simmons, and unfortunately Larry Matisek, the voice of Wrestling at the Chase, has passed away. Uh, but Herb Simmons was still keeping it strong going into his 47th year. And I, at the time, as of uh, bell time on Saturday, this, this last Saturday, December 28, 2019, I was the champ, 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 because I was not only the New Breed Wrestling United States champion, but I was also the MMWA heavyweight champion and the SICW Southern Illinois Championship Wrestling Classic champion, which is their top title. So, yeah, I, was, I walked in as the champ, champ, champ with three championships, and unfortunately things didn't go right, uh, didn't go my way, and I walked out one belt short and without my hair, because my championship and my hair was on the line, and that was an eight-year grow. My hair was older than my daughter. Yeah, and and you know. have a beautiful daughter, by the way, Phoenix and her martial arts. <laughs> it's It's hard not to watch what's going on there. 
But your hair, she'll just have to fill its place. That's just what's happening. As she grows in the way it would have. No, I mean, I, this is an important part because losing is a part of professional wrestling, just like politics, right? So what do you do after you lose? Do you just give up and cry in a cave? Or do you go shoot more promos with your beautiful wife? Well, no, what you do is you challenge for your uh, contractually obligated rematch and you have a rematch for that same title on January 18th for the East Carondelet at the East Carondelet Community Center. All right. That, that nice plug. I, that was good. Fun. Is that going to be available to watch on the internet? People can follow SICW Wrestling Explosion on Facebook. Okay. Right now, we're not on television. We were on television until about a year ago. Channel 198 on Charter in the St. Louis area. And, yeah, we're, we're not doing that anymore because just as many people can be reached on the internet and on television. More people. And yeah, even more people. Yeah, I know. It's it's amazing. I'm, I'm writing a piece right now to, that I'm going to be releasing some articles over the next couple of weeks. And, you know, very early on, I'm talking about organizing before the internet. And then literally there's a section called, and the internet changed everything. Because it, it really did, and still is, as we are here podcasting to you over the internet. So I want to ask you a couple of questions. From um, California while I'm in Missouri. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. With, you gotta with, love that. With like no lag except for the sound of my own voice making me sound drunk. Uh, it's my first time. Please be gentle. <laughs> Don's not used to the headphones. <laughs> yeah. We're going to, it's a work, it's a um, we're grassroots. It's just for a little bit further of a plug, if anybody's in the St. Louis area that's going to be listening to this in January, MMWA, January 11th. We're going to have Ron Simmons, WWE Hall of Famer, in the house. He's going to be signing autographs. I don't know. He may get involved. He's still physically capable, so we'll see how that goes. Wow. Um, and then in February, in SICW, we're going to have Tito Santana, oh. who is also a WWE Hall of Famer. Yeah, I know that name, and not just because it sounds like the musician. I actually am familiar <laughs> with the wrestler. I was a big WWF fan way too late in life, some people would say, but I think they were wrong. I actually got to meet The Rock one time. We both learned how to ride a camel together. My uncle was a location scout on the Scorpion King, and my mom had him <laughs> ride a camel at her ranch. So I got to, that was my peak moment. It was hard to go back after that. But, <laughs> uh, but it's, I, like a, it's like a, a concert. You just got to rock with it. Oh, yeah, I, <laughs> exactly. So we're not done with you just yet, uh, though those were, that's a lot of things uh, if you're in the Missouri area to definitely be looking into, St. Louis specifically. If you're a professional wrestler, get a hold of Herb Simmons on the internet, on Facebook, and he can point you in the right direction. You go to Bob Orton's uh, school. Cowboy Bob Orton has a school in conjunction with SICW, and it's one of the best places to learn the craft and learn how to be a professional wrestler. Yeah, I know. It seems like you're having a really great time. I'm not going to lie. You've definitely re given me a little resurgence. Cause, so Curtis and I have been friends for a couple of years now from going to the DNC meetings. I have been working on the Super Daily Reform and a couple other things. Curtis was just being the best DNC member from Missouri imaginable at all times, constantly giving epic speeches fighting for all the things. So let's let's take for a second real fast. You know, there was a couple of big votes that happened with the DNC, and I think that we're going to use these to sort of define who we're talking to if we have somebody on the uh, on the line. And I think that one of the big votes was the Super Daily Reform, which yeah. I'm sure... Yeah, right? And the other big one was the debate for a climate change... Uh, excuse me, the climate change debate. Got that in the wrong order. The climate change debate, which famously, you know, uh, the young people across the country were pushing for. And I understand the semantics reasons, but I, I, I think that's ah, all hogwash. Yeah, I understand the semantics, but I think at the same time, like it was so little they had to do. But I think these are like two of the most important votes that really define where 
our DNC members are at a moment. Is there a third vote you can think of? No, I'm sh- I'm sh- I'm I'm shaking my oh, head, Curtis, because oh, oh, yeah, the yeah. DNC chair. But I'm shaking my head on this because I don't buy the semantics. I hear what you're saying. They're trying to say like, well, if we do a climate change yeah. debate, that means we have to do one for criminal justice. We have to do one for this. Oh, and I'm just like, well, why don't but, we? But let me just point out something that I think needs to be pointed out. The first sure. person, and Curtis, you were there in the room too. The first person that got up to defend this position was a fossil fuel lobbyist, Maria Cardona. Yeah. Yeah. I sat there, I saw it, I listened to it, so you cannot tell me and that this isn't about money. she's an appointed DNC yes, she's member. she's a Tom right? Perez yeah. appointee. So one of the things that's cool about the DNC that a lot of people don't know, and I, you know, I hope to remove that, you know, Curtis is also part of it, or taking that mask off of it, as it were. And so, you know, votes from the DNC, now you do kind of need to know where to look for it, but these are all public votes, right, Curtis? Like most of these meetings are open to the public. Yeah, as for bylaws. Uh, as for bylaws, then, but they'll it, try to keep people out. <laughs> yeah, but then you just quote the, the bylaws. That, that she was appointed is one of the reasons that makes the chair vote so important in yes. my view. When it was Ellison versus Perez, because and, and Buttigieg was in there as well. By he the was. Way. That's true. Uh, yeah. And this is why and, also uh, Pete's doing so well. Just for all our listeners, so that they know he was able to make really good relationships with the DNC leadership while he was running for chair. And so when he ran for this, he already had those relationships on deck. And that's something to think about if you're getting into politics. Curtis, walk us through the chair election a little bit and what you perceive as some of the problems with it. Well, I didn't perceive too many problems with it as long as you have the right DNC members voting. So in my view, what I would like to get the People who you vote for in your state, the DNC members who you put up, are the people who vote on the chair of the DNC. So that that was a very close race. Perez had 200, I believe. Ellison had 200. Perez had uh, just a little over that. Buttigieg had 15. And then uh, I was uh, under the understanding that Buttigieg was going to throw his supporters behind Ellison. And I saw that that wasn't the case because when it came down to it, the judge threw his supporters behind Perez, and Perez is the one who won. So it, it, that's how important the DNC members can be to the chair's race. And the DNC chair is the one who appoints up to 75 appointees. And those 75 people can sway most elections, especially when you, you team them with the, the weight of the ASDC. The chairs and vice chairs of every state have their own group, committee, and they can sway elections. So, uh, but then the DNC also has power over the ASDC members where they can say, well, we're not going to give your states grants if you don't vote in our way. And that's partially what happened with the uh, climate change debate. Walk us through that. Why do you think it's similar to what happened with the climate change debate? Well, I, I, I don't think it's similar. I think that I happen to know that there were people in the ASDC, people who were chairs and vice chairs and Democratic chairs and vice chairs of state that were, I don't know how forthcoming the message came to them, but they were basically under the understanding that if they didn't vote for Perez and for not having a climate change debate, that their state wasn't going to get the grant that the DNC doles out. So just so everyone knows, the ASDC is the basically the body of chairs and vice chairs across the country. The DNC is made up of mostly elected people except the 75 appointed by the chair. So this ASDC body is actually really important. And I personally have worked with the ASDC chair on the superdelegate reform. And then there is a really neat top-down system from there. Like, if you can convince him or them or her, or whoever it is, of something, it does affect the whole party, which is very, very cool. But there is, especially after the superdelegate reform, there was this pushback, which I'm sure you noticed, Curtis. And it started after we started making climate moves. I think it was R.L. Miller here right. in, in California yeah. and Christine Pelosi were putting together these... I can't remember what exactly they're called, but they, they put them up to vote and they went through amendments, amendments right? 
Yeah, oh yeah, uh, resolutions. Oh, right? resolutions. Yeah, and they go through a couple of steps of the body, and one of them even passed, and then was reversed on the back end because these donors, which are essentially oil and gas, basically threw their weight down, and that's really what it came down to. That wasn't the understanding that I was under uh, on the ground. The understanding that I was under is they passed uh, one of the resolutions, which was like Resolution Three or Resolution Five which says that the candidates could have a town hall right. on the same stage at the same time. That's, and they passed it. They did. When they didn't realize that what they were passing was basically a debate about climate change with multiple candidates. Curtis, walk us through that again, because I think your points wasn't entirely clear, and I think it's really important. Okay, so the resolution that they passed originally that did make it through the resolutions committee was that the candidates could have a town hall on climate change with multiple candidates on the same stage at the same time. But they worded it as a town hall. That mm-hmm. one made it through. The one that said the fate did not make it through. Once they figured out that the town hall could be a debate because all the candidates were going to be on the same stage at the same time discussing climate change, that's when the pushback happened, and that's when they tried to usurp us, and they did. And they did that with mostly appointed members, and many of the ballots that were turned in said, my vote is whatever the chair is voting. So my vote is at the pleasure of the chair, because they are appointed at the pleasure of the chair. Mm-hmm. So that's how those 75 votes can sway pretty much most elections that happen on the floor with DNC members. And then you look at the ASDC, and it's the chair and vice chair of each state. And that's two votes right there. They get two votes, too. So if there's four elected DNC members from Missouri, we've also got the chair and vice chair who were elected at the state committee from state committee members. So you have to start at your county committee, go up to the state committee to be able to vote on your chair and vice chair and make sure that they're reflecting your values and they're reflecting what you want to see from this party. So we need people to start getting involved and realize that those things have to happen in order for them to be there to vote on the right people at the right time. You know, there is so much truth to what he just said right there, and I really need everyone to hear this. You know, catching these folks at the right time and the right moment, you have no idea. Like, I tell the stories of the influence that I've had over certain people by just being in that right place at the right time. And people don't believe me. And then we see later on, I mean, I had a story which we're hoping to have Ron Harris, I'm sure you're familiar with him, on to discuss some more of this exact details. But he, you know, working how I caught Donna Brazil at the end of the DNC elections. I got a couple of minutes with her and that was able to push her and do this whole drive for honesty in the party. And at the same time, when, you know, we needed something later on when they, they were messing something up after the superdelegate reform, we were able to get her to offer a correction and put it forward. And that's because we just put ourselves out there. There's so much in progressivisms to never talk to these people, but they're looking for ideas from anyone. And if we just leave it open to these corporate lobbyists who are paid to go convince these people what to think, then that's what's going to happen. Yeah, well, I mean, like for the climate debate, you brought up down in Brazil, which leads me into this next thing. Before I went to the DNC, I didn't even know what the DNC was. And then I was elected to the DNC, so I had to find out. And I (laughs) I took a crash course in it by being there and doing it. But one of the positions that it put me in, and it's put me in many interesting positions already and situations, but John Brazil and I were on the opposite side of the superdelegate debate in Chicago. And what happened was she said her piece, I said my piece. Unfortunately, I followed Nina Turner. So most of the time that I was speaking, I was thinking to myself, what am I thinking following Nina Turner? (laughs) I I should have just said Nina Turner. She's a hard act to follow. Sat back down. (laughs) But what happened after that was we saw each other in the bar which is one of the big surprises to me. I thought the DNC was going to be Democratic National Committee members 
sitting in a room discussing the important issues that are facing our party and are facing our country. And it's really not that. It's figuring out what the next big vote is and trying to whip people to vote in your direction. So a lot of the deals are done at bars. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the, the talking is done at the, the hotel lobby. Yeah. Um, and I, I was down there, and I think Wisconsin had a party in, in Wisconsin, uh, Miami, and Houston were pulling for the convention. And Milwaukee had a party, and even though Donna Brazil and I were on separate sides of the debate at that particular time, I walked by her table and she grabbed me by the arm and like pulled my suit coat said, like, have a seat with me. And so I sat down and I sat and had drinks with Donna for probably an hour or more where we talked about the superdelegate situation and where I stood and where she stood and how we envisioned the future of the party. And then I had the opportunity to introduce her to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So maybe she'll remember me a little bit more than the average cat because I'm the guy who chased down Kareem Abdul-Jabbar so she could meet him. And I don't know how she voted the next day, but she heard me that night. And more of those conversations need to happen. Yeah, that's really true. I was actually there for that meeting. I actually witnessed all of the events that he's talking about. And we were specifically, I believe, at the if Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was there, that was the Houston party going on in the main area of the bar. Does that sound um, about right? You said it was Houston. Um, yeah, I did that. It was Houston or Wisconsin. I don't follow sports. Right. Well, I am actually holding in my hand right now my 2020 Democratic National Convention, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, <laughs> because they gave us water bottles at one of the parties. And it spared no expense. It turned out to be actually a quite a nice water bottle. So that uh, I think is kind it's of funny. Miami gave out flip flops. <laughs> they did. They did. Which is kind of funny considering how Florida votes. No, the whole politics around the thing, you know, we joke and I'll make ha ha ha, but really it is an immense, just a waste of money that they, <laughs> they spend so much on these parties. It, it's kind of hard to go to them and not feel that level of waste happening. But it is a good time, so there's that. So, Curtis, I want to ask you a question about the superdelegates. So we did some reform there, and they're not going to vote till the second round. In your opinion, are we going to make it to a second round where they are going to affect the outcome? Well, I am begging and pleading everyone not to allow me to vote. <laughs> um, because if I vote, that means that the other superdelegates get to vote. That means that we made it to the second ballot, right? Mm -hmm. And that cannot happen. Because if that happens, it's going to go very much like the chairs race. It's going to go very much like the climate change debate. And things are not going to go the direction that the rest is one. Even if the American people have voted and Bernie is in the lead, they're going, I believe, go the other direction. Whatever is going to appease the donor class, is what's going to happen. So yeah. that has to be avoided at all costs. How do we avoid so that? The 15% that? state okay. rule, I think, is one way. This Let's is, talk about that. This is where suddenly well, I become relevant for a moment. And Curtis, you can speak to this and tell me how Missouri does it specifically. But there's a little rule hidden in the delicate allegations that everyone really needs to pay attention to. Now, I do want to say, first off, that I do think the media, who is the blackout to some degree, has been ending, and very awkwardly, they're still not sure how to report on him. But I think this is to lull us into a false sense of security. I think this is the time that everyone in the movement needs to work harder and push more than ever before, because the worst thing that could happen right now is that Bernie Sanders wins the nomination, but we lose the general election. So let's get that out of the way. We got to make sure that doesn't happen. So if we win this primary, which we're going to talk about right now, how we can win the primary, and this is we're going to wrap this show up on too, is that what happened, I witnessed it happen with Gillum. When someone they don't like wins the primary, they pull the rug out from underneath them in the field game or whatever it is, and something sneaky that's hard to fix. With Gillum, it was delayed field that was broken. We ended up fixing ours in Jacksonville, and we won our district for the first time in 25 years or something like that. It was a long time, and it was only because we were prepared for what was happening, and other groups weren't. That's where the bulks of the votes were. We lost Florida. 
in 2018. And this is my fear for 2020. So I want to put that out there. But when we're talking about the primary, and this is something I learned in 2016, that's really important, even more important now, because of the superdelegate rule, is how the delegate allocation works. Because we talk about popular vote all day long. And I think if the 2016 election taught us anything is that popular vote doesn't mean anything. What it really comes down to is how many delegates you have and how far that goes. Now, real quickly, it's a super delegate. So everybody knows and what Curtis is, it mean technically they're not called super delegates. That's why people are like, why didn't they abolish super delegates? Because it's not really a thing. It's an informal term for a delegate that can both vote on the first ballot and vote however they want, hence super. But they were called automatic delegates. Now they have been relabeled as and what is what is the what is the new label now or is it is it automatic delegates the new one did i mix it up i think it's automatic delegates. it's automatic yeah now now before it was unpledged or appointed no before it was unpledged delegates i've I've heard some people say appointed delegates that's a that's inside of the but you know they're only doing that because super delegates has a bad connotation now so that's well well the thing is is that we did the super delegates was never actually a thing i think the important factor is It, it was people understood it well that's true but follow me on this and this is a good opportunity tell me how you think about this tina and 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 throw in two curtis is that when you remove their ability to automatically vote for whoever they want on the first ballot you take away one of the things that made them super in the sense of what made them super delegates so okay. now if we I'll go to that. if we go to second ballot they become super delegates again. They can yeah. vote however they want. It's a total thing. But keep in mind, most delegates are unbound on the second round, except for a few states. So that's something that everybody is going to be like the Wild West. That's going to be crazy. So we have to do everything we can do well, to avoid that. there's going to be that. a lot of horse race politics and going on behind the scenes if we get that far. But what I want to know is how do we not get that far? Good question. We achieve 50% plus one delegate mm-hmm. uh, for Bernie Sanders. Right. We, we have to get- Fifty percent plus one in order for it not to go to the second ballot and therefore go to the super delegate choice. Because only pledged delegates are eligible to vote on the first round. Now a lot of people are talking about that rule changing. Well, I that's want- why I want to bring up the fifteen percent rule because all of those candidates that are getting two and three mm-hmm, percent at the mm-hmm. primary, those delegates are going to get allocated. My understanding is at least allocated to. Whoever's at 14, 15 percent. Well, so this is exactly the way it works. So unless okay. you get 15 percent, you are not eligible for delegates at all. And oh, delegates okay. are reproportioned based on everyone above 15 percent. Above 15. So the cutoff literally is 15. 15. So the guy that gets 14 gets none. Nothing. The 15. Yeah. Well, this is where we can win that. This so if Bernie where gets we can 15 win. and Warren and Biden both have 14, or, you're saying all of those delegates go to Bernie. If it works okay. into, it's reproportioned, everyone above 15%. So you can go out of election night with only a plurality yeah. and leave the delegate allocation with a majority. Now, this is why it's so important for what Curtis is doing to really be heard. because. Yeah. It's not just Curtis we need to have do this. We need people to do this all over the country. Now, in 2016, we saw some tricky delegate allocation in a couple of different places. Now, Missouri was one of them. Missouri, we were able to turn the tides on them, organize people like Curtis all over the state. And that's how those delegate seats, excuse me, those DNC seats went to Bernie Crest. So when we talk about entryism or dementor as a concept, we already know it functions. So as we approach this reality of this 15 percent, brother, it's a strategy. Thank it's you. Strategy, thank you. Yeah. It's a strategy. Yeah, I feel like I feel like I've heard that before from somebody, you know, yeah. who? Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so the 15 percent rule is going to keep people and see, the other thing is it, they're going to be inconsistent. Biden's going to get above in certain states. Pete's going to get above it in other states. So it's not necessarily going to be a one versus the other right. pony race. They're going to end up with just a few delegates in each state. So when you talk about Dementor or entryism as a con- as a strategy, then you definitely want to keep in mind that we need people going in so we don't have the creative math because this is a game of numbers. This is a game of fractions. You put enough fractions together, you end up with a whole delegate, and that's how this delegate system really works in its simplest form. Mm-hmm. This the precincts vote up to the counties, that vote up to the states, that vote up to national. And it's all, you're just combining those fractions into whole numbers. So if we are giving up too much 
and not doing the work or we're not going and checking the numbers, we're not making sure that balance sheet is in the right place, then we're just giving the opportunity for these corporatists to come in and make their move. And I think the DA's race, I believe it's in Queens, was in Queens that we saw it happen. New York, it was in New York, New York City. Which one are you? Uh, The one that we closed on election night with it being like a toss up, but leaning towards the progressive. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it was in Tiffany Cabong. Tiffany Cabong, right? Am I saying that right? yeah. Okay, excellent. I should have probably, well, we're just doing it from the hip here today, folks. <laughs> so I think that her race is really a lesson that we can't close an election night within the margin. We have to be outside the margin. I think we can lean on Ocasio's win, actually, because she hammered that win. There weren't enough ballots left to be counted anywhere. Well, to now flip we're getting into a different well, it's conversation. Just the, it's the whole concept of, of the fractions game. You're right. We're getting a lot of concept. We'll get into this another right, show. Because you could look at San Francisco DA race and Chase Boudin went into that on the fringes of margins, but because they have ranked choice voting, right. he ended up Well, that's winning. also, it, it's, it, and this goes back to my original point. It's not just a matter of who votes. It's a matter of who counts the votes. I hate to yeah, quote or a how Nazi they count or the vote. whatever, yeah. but that's the truth. Or how they count the yeah, vote, for sure. exactly. So I want to know what Curtis thinks about this 15 percent is this a plausible route to the 51 or do you have a different thought on that i think it is a plausible route and it's 50 percent plus one delegate a lot of people have 51 percent uh, yes that my 50% apologies 50 percent plus it's one a delegate simple yeah. majority <laughs> gotcha right and so yes the 15 percent delegate allocation can definitely work in our favor because, it, like the numbers that you threw out, that Biden's got 14, Warren's got 14, Bernie's got 15, mm-hmm. Bernie gets all of uh, the delegates. If it's a winner take all state, I believe. They are all uh, winner take all, yeah. Oh, no, they're not. Sorry, the, sorry. It's proportional. I don't know why yeah, I said it, Republicans it, are winner take all. My you have to reach 15% to get any delegates to reach the threshold for delegate allocation. So I think that that can work in our favor. I think yeah. that. If there's any states that Bernie doesn't hit 15 percent, then it's going to work against us, obviously. Mm-hmm. But that would work against us if he was at 14 percent or three, right. because he's not going to get a delegate. Period. The other thing that we have to think about is on the back end. If we don't reach the 50 percent plus one, then it's a very real possibility that it's going to go to super delegate. And in that case, states need to make sure. And the super delegates that have already been elected. Are, are pretty well set down for 2020. But looking forward even after that, because Bernie is going to need a friendly party if he's able to win. Uh, so that was Obama's mistake. When he won the nomination, his people didn't stick around in order to do all the DNC seats. And that's how Hillary's people took control of everything. So I think what you're saying is really something the audience needs to take heed with. I think the Democratic Party as a whole, once Obama won, and they threw up their hands and said, we won, they walked away. Or we wouldn't have lost a thousand seats in 10 years while they're preaching about best practice. But I look at how it's going to move forward. Like I told the kids of the Sunshine Movement when we were trying to push through the climate change debate, if your DNC members are not representing you and your values, then you need to figure out how to replace them. You need to figure out your delegate selection plan in each state and figure out how to become delegates because those delegates, at least in Missouri, and it's different for many states, but at least in Missouri, those delegates that were chosen at the delegate selection meetings that are coming up quickly are the ones who vote for the DNC members. But then you've also got to make sure that you're taking over county committees because those county committees and the legislative chairs and vice chairs for those county committees, and senatorial district chairs and vice chairs, those are the people who vote on the state committee, at least in Missouri. I can't speak for every state. Okay. Um, so you got to make sure that you take over the county committee, get those seats. Those people are the ones who vote for the state committee, and the state committee, at least in Missouri, vote for the chair and vice chair, and that's how you get more progressive into the DNC, because that chair and vice chair also have votes. Right. So the county committees are very important for that reason, but those are also a stepping stone to DNC membership in other ways, or no? Yeah, like I said, you start at your county committee, one, you're going to know 
about all the delegate selection plans. Right. You're going to know where to go. You're going to know the people to talk to, and a lot of people are going to know you. Mm-hmm. Myself, in my situation in 2016, I didn't know very many people. I didn't really learn too many people until after I was elected to the DNC. And the only reason that I was elected to the DNC is because the Bernie delegation and the Hillary delegation couldn't come to terms because the Bernie delegation wanted two and two, a man and a woman, from each side, from the Hillary delegation and the Bernie delegation. The Hillary delegation said no, and that they wanted all four. So the Bernie delegation said, no, we're going to take all four now. Yeah. And then they... Taking, taking all or nothing thing. to next levels of well, yeah, they did Hillary it to Clinton themselves. Supporters. Yeah, yeah, they did it yeah, to themselves. So, My God. So then they started, and the Bernie delegation started organizing, started phone banking our own delegates and getting people on board. They threw out a, a call and said, who wants to be on the DNC? And that's when I spoke up. I didn't know what the DNC was. So I raised my hand and said, I want to be on the DNC. You're like, sure, but you let didn't me know check. better yet is what happened. <laughs> I said, I want to be on the DNC. What's the DNC? That's um, funny. And then I didn't hear anything back. I filled out some vetting paperwork. Um, I didn't hear anything back until the day of our state convention. I showed up 20 minutes late to the Bernie delegation <laughs> pre-state convention meeting. Because I hadn't heard anything, so I wasn't in a real rush. But when I got to the building, they rushed me onto the stage. <laughs> and, um, I looked at the person next to me and said, why am I here? <laughs> and they, said, they said, well, you're uh, on the Bernie delegation for DNC members. You're on our slate. Nice. I Moving said, oh, faster okay. than it can tell its own people. Classic. I had to give a, a one-minute speech and introduce myself, and I'm pretty at home on a microphone, given that I'm a professional wrestler. So I did that, and then later that day, I gave a four-minute speech, and before you knew it, I was on the DNC. <laughs> now, here's the thing. This is something that a lot of people don't think about. This is a completely volunteer position. As a matter of fact, you end up spending quite a bit of money now this is something that I think people should know. And I think that if we're going to put young people into positions on TNC, that we have to be able to crowdsource to make sure they can actually get to these events. Because as somebody, I went and I crowdsource, it can be kind of expensive. Extremely expensive. Insanely expensive. One, there's $500 a year dues. Did not Two, know that. Yeah, people don't know that. I didn't know that until after I got elected. <laughs> That's true. Two, they have them in some of the most expensive cities in the, the country, right. uh, including San Francisco. Yeah. And in San Francisco, my wife and I stayed with uh, our Missouri DNC elected, uh, Megan Aaliyah Green, and she paid half on the room. We paid the other half, and our half was like $750. Wow. wow. That's not even like what we dealt with in That's the DNC in 2016. Oh, the flights. That's not including the flight. Fortunately enough, I have had someone who supports my work on the DNC who happened to be a Hillary delegate in 2016. Wow. And she has given sky miles to allow me to get to DNC meeting. Nice. This was something we tried to do a little bit in 2016. I'm glad to hear other people are doing it. We did a Miles for Bernie Sanders delegates program a little bit in. And so... I think this is where we talk about democratic socialism, right? Where we have to come together and do these things and actually be an active part of it all. And I think that this comes back to the conversation of, you know, we're tying back everything together we talked about today, you know, with Iran right now and what's happening. There are anti-war movements. And let's be honest, America badly needs an anti-war movement. It's needed it for a long time. The drone programs are insane. That just what we do is ridiculous and we need an anti-war and this is our moment and right now there's really only one anti-war candidate there's really only one candidate that's voted against increasing the budget in the defense and increasing you know just general military spending or giving a blank check to trump to do what he's been doing the past 24 36 hours i mean we just passed the defense bill and here we are seeing the outcome so now is really a time to get involved i think that when you look at the... Well, comp- who is that one guy you didn't say? Who, which one? Who's the one guy that didn't give Trump the blank check? Uh, oh, well, why don't... Does anybody else... Is, do we not know? Oh, well, that would be Bernie 
Motherfucking Sanders. Sanders. <laughs> yeah, I know. We there's there's more than one meme going around of Bernie sitting there as all the other presidential candidates applaud the march to war that Trump put forward, like you mm-hmm. would expect from any Republican. So, you know, I don't want to sit here and be just a mouthpiece for the Bernie Sanders campaign, but I think I'm under all the cir- for that. Yeah, you know, you're good with that? Yeah, she's good with that. I think Curtis is actually <laughs> supportive. Really him. Him. Yeah, Curtis exactly. has endorsed him, yeah. But I do want to say that when you look at the big picture and what we're dealing with between climate change, the systemic change, and not just normal reformative change that some candidates are promising, but a truly revolutionary change. Now, keep in mind, guys, for all my listeners out there, there is a real important rule about being revolutionary, and you can look this up, Wikipedia about social movements. You must both be inclusive to all and wish radical change for those groups. If the change isn't for everybody, you're a reformative movement, and we're trying to be revolutionary right now. So keep that in mind when you're excluding people or thinking about maybe, I don't know that person, you need to be inclusive. I mean, bad people, of course, they're going to hurt you, keep them at a distance. You know what I'm trying to say here. No, the point being is, is we have to earn votes. And sometimes that entails speaking with folks that you might not necessarily agree with on everything. And, you know, I hear what you're saying a lot of times, but I mainly see this from the neoliberal side of the Mm. party. They're the first ones to beat people up Mm. for no reason. Mm. Well, you're think, on Twitter more than I am. Yeah, so I mean, like, it. a good example would be just recently I got into, I tried to get into a polite conversation with a gun <laughs> rights activist, I'm not going to name names, but who hates Bernie Sanders, who basically told me that he would not vote for Bernie Sanders if he was the Democratic nominee. So I was like, so who are you going to vote for, Trump? Just ask what state they live in from now on. Florida. First. Oh, that's a problem. <laughs> what, but my point being is like, and so I said, so then you're really not for gun reform, are you? No. Because if you were, I'm you would realize <laughs> that no conservative is going to support those positions that you claim to be advocating for. And that tells me right there that that is a class issue all the way. He's protecting his wealth. I mean, the ladies that are listening that haven't got it yet, we're the class of one. This is class warfare. It is, is class not, warfare. This is not about Republican versus Democrat. This is not about centrist versus progressive. It's about the haves versus the have not. Oh, I agree. It's and, a platonomy and, and everybody simple. else. So, you know, we, uh, Tina and I, have just started working together, and it's been a pretty good time. And we were fortunate enough to be in Venice Beach right before the blackout ended or began to end. I know I'm wrapping it up right here. I promise everyone. So... We were fortunate enough to interview an assemblyman that had recently switched from Harris when she dropped out to Bernie Sanders. And it came down to a very simple idea. And I want to leave everyone with this. He said, and he didn't say it during the speech, he said it just to us. He said the reason was someone convinced him that Bernie should be his number two candidate. Now that works. It works when you're dealing with candidates dropping out. When you're dealing with Mm -hmm. Iowa, where delegates get reallocated until you have 15%, when you're dealing with New Hampshire, where people with less than 12% are going to be dropping out, we need to pick up those votes. I don't disagree. It seems obvious to me, and I don't know why it's not obvious to everybody else, the Tulsi Gabbard voters will come to Bernie and vote for Bernie. I don't think that's... not if we're toxic to them. That's my point. Not if we're toxic to them. And there's too much of that going on, in my opinion. So I think everybody needs to keep in mind what we're trying to do. We're trying to take the White House. We're getting a second chance at this, something that not a lot of people get or I've ever. Folks, just remember how awful it felt to have Hillary Clinton trolls call you a vile person, a C-U-N-T. Think of all of that stuff that went down in 2016 and how that made you feel. It's a little golden rule, action. I hate getting all biblical on people, but I think it's true. Think but about how they would people affect you. People will forget what you said, but they're not going to forget how you made them feel. And if they feel that much anger towards you and your candidate, it doesn't matter about the policy anymore. I know for me, like... I had no problem voting for a Jill Stein being the way the Hillary Clinton people had treated Mm. me. And I'm not just talking about Hillary Clinton voters. I'm talking about people in her campaign. And also, keep in mind, guys, it's not just the person you're arguing with who is a human being and needs to get treated like a human being. Even if they don't treat you like one, that's not the way we are supposed to do things. Yeah, Uh, There's a difference between a reasoned debate and correcting somebody when they're saying something completely wrong. And Well, they won't say there is. They'll say it's the same thing. The point is, is that old Ultimately, lurkers are the ones that decide this election. Lurkers are the ones that are going to decide this election. It's not the people who comment. It's the people who don't comment. So put your best face forward. 
Let's get that 50% plus one. Let's make sure it doesn't go to a second ballot. And then let's start worrying about dealing with the monstrosity in the White House. Because if we're not pushing with a candidate other than Bernie Sanders through to November, I don't see how we're going to pull the voters we need in order to take down an incumbent president, even one as vile and toxic as he is. So, mm-hmm. so let's all keep that in mind. And Tina, to Curtis? I would like to hear Curtis's last parting wisdoms on that subject. Well, as far as what Tina was saying, we definitely need to not be vile to other people. People do remember the way that you make them feel. Mm-hmm. But I do have to disagree with her on one sure. point. It can be policy-based. We need to keep it to the policies because the fact is that even the the most right-wing Republicans can come together with us on certain policies. Oh, I agree. The most strict Trump voter still voted for Trump, in my estimation, because they thought that the government I agree. I actually don't disagree with you, Curtis. ...worked for them. They thought that, that our system was beyond repair, and they decided to just throw Trump in there. But once it comes down to the policies, once it comes down to do you want your wife to be able to receive health care even if she can't afford it? Do you want to not lose your home because you get cancer? Do you want to not lose your health care and your insurance because you get a new job? You know, once you talk to them on those levels, most people agree with progressive policies, even in Missouri. Everybody thinks that Missouri is super red. Mm-hmm. And in certain aspects, it is because they always vote for Republicans. They right. always vote for Republicans because so many of the Democrats that they see are too busy trying to push for the right, trying to push right because they want to find that center. But every time they find the center, the right pushes for the right. Before you know it, you have people calling themselves Democrats who are voting like Republicans. So progressive policies can win. There is middle ground that can be found in progressive policies across all political spectrum, mm-hmm. and we need to find that middle ground. On I agree. Policy. I agree. And that middle ground is going to bring us to a progressive candidate for president. Yeah, we need to find the middle ground candidate. with the people from policy. And that's sort of like how the personal connection is gold and I'll, we'll talk about this later in the show i have some stories to share oklahoma other states hard red seats where people went out they made the personal connections and they won those state house seats and they're still in them we'll actually see if we can get them in an interview so curtis tina is there anything you want to say before we go you good you all right all right she's done so thank you everyone for joining us tonight it's been a wild ride on our first show curtis thank you so much for being here and really sharing some light on not a this problem, situation not, not a problem thank you Thanks, Tina. I yeah. just want to let everybody know where I'll be, what's happened. January 11th, I'll be downtown St. Louis, South Broadway Athletic Club. I'll be in the main event there. I'm the heavyweight champion. One Ooh. week later, January 18th, <laughs> I'll be in the West, Illinois, just over the border from St. Louis. If you're in the Midwest, come check that out. I'll have seven. And also check out my website, curtiswild.com, B-U-R-T-I-S-W-Y-L-D-E. And be on the lookout for my podcast, The Wild Side, spelled the same way, W-Y-L-D-E-S-Y-E-E. You can like that right now on Facebook, facebook.com slash The Wild Side, W-Y-L-D-E-S-Y-D-E, The Wild Side. Well, I want to thank you for bringing The Wild Side to us tonight, Curtis, let me tell you. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. Today's broadcast was brought to you by Don E. Ford and Tina Desiree Burke, as well as volunteers working to make a better world for everyone. 